a voice of great beauty and a perfect control in every register. A voice of great flexibility and a more than usual range. Acting ability and great stamina. With four out of these six qualities, you might find that an ardent admirer had scribbled on the door of your dressing room these words. This happened to me not so long ago at La Scala in Milan. The dressing room. Backstage, the applause seems rather faint and far away. Flowers arrive just before the performance when there's not much time to enjoy them. And afterwards, you're just too tired or busy. Dresses. I love them. And then there are always telegrams. Lovely to get them, and they come from both strangers and good friends. Here is one I cherish, from another prima donna. A glance, that's all, while you're making up for a performance. In front of the mirror, the dressing room becomes a kind of confessional. It's the best place for self-criticism. The only place a prima donna can be alone. I was first called prima donna only three years ago. The public put me into a line, a sort of family tree of a few women who have sung certain famous and difficult roles before me. Lucia, Norma, Violetta, Amina, Elvira. In some tiny dressing room of their own, my musical ancestors waited for their cue. Whenever we sing or hear the great arias of those days, we remember their names. This is Amelita Gallicucci. On the stage, she was small and delicate, and even today, she has the manner that made her famous. Many people still remember hearing her ethereal voice. It just seemed to float. A countrywoman of mine, Nellie Melba. Critics complained of her coldness as an actress, but as a person, she was far from cold. Unlike her temper, her voice was very even and spanned over two octaves. She ruled the stage at Covent Garden for 20 years. First a violinist and pianist, then a prima donna. Marcella Sembrich, a Polish-American singer. Another soprano of great range. Even in her highest registers, the voice was most expressive. She retired in 1909. The year Sembrich was born, Adelina Patti made her debut, 1859. And Patti's final concert was in her 72nd year. She had an enormous repertoire of 36 operas, great variety of style. She did both lyric and dramatic roles, and all with perfect method and finished artistry. This is Emma La Jeunesse, born in Chambly near Montreal, known in opera as Albani. Gounod admired her so much that he wrote waltzes for her. Her appearance was charming as a girl, and her voice was particularly rich in the higher registers. She sang all the great coloratura roles, but she was also famous for her Wagner. The first Elvira in Ipuritani, Giulia Grisi, a real prima donna. She had several parts written specially for her. She had a dual fault over her, and in St. Petersburg, after 20 curtain calls, the Tsar presented her with expensive gifts, the greatest artist of her day. Both Grisi and Maria Malibran were born in the early 1800s, but Malibran died very young, at 28. Her father and sister were both singers, and she herself was a great beauty, an outstanding actress, and what these days is called a personality. Henrietta Sontag. When she was 17, Weber offered her the title role in Oriante, and from then on her career was one unbroken triumph. Her greatest roles were in Mozart, Susanna and Don Anna. They said of Judita Pasta that she transformed natural faults into rare gifts. She was unattractive, her figure ungraceful, her voice at the beginning husky and weak, but she worked to become a great singer and an influential teacher. And finally, Jenny Lind, the Swedish nightingale. Her bright, thrilling voice, her gift for ornamentation, her range of feeling from brilliant arias to simple songs, put all Europe at her feet. 
When she toured America under contract to P.T. Barnum, there were riots in the streets. And when she came into Toronto by boat, she was smuggled into a secret dock to prevent her being mobbed. These are some of my ancestors. <laughs> 